Hammond of the Church of Christ. We're meeting right here at 250 The Boulevard in downtown Eden. If you want to hear more plain Bible teaching, watch A Word from the Lord Thursday nights at 9 o'clock right here on WGSR. I couldn't stand Johnny at first. I thought he was a nut. And once I read the Bible for myself, I'm able to accept the truth now. All right. And it doesn't make me angry. I'm talking about the Lauren Hardy show on Wednesday. Don't worry about them, son, y'all. Get off of it, would you? Don't dare do that again. Shut that up. Shut that up. Shut that up. As your pastor, I am telling you, please, don't waste your time on Wednesday nights watching this television program. If you're looking for Laurel and Hardy, I left my derby and I left my cane, but I did bring my Bible. If you'll read along with me, you'll find that the persons who are making the accusations, they're really the ones who have a problem. I hear them telling you to shut up, that you're going to be embarrassed, and I even hear them flat out saying, I'm telling you what to do as a pastor. Give me a chance and I'll give you what does the Bible say. Always ask for what does the Bible say. Get it right here on Star News. New time, Thursday nights at 9 o'clock. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James Olfer here with you. So glad that you are watching. Had some good calls coming in on what does the Bible say, and I hope that you will uh, uh, stay tuned. We're going to get the, call, the phone lines coming in uh, momentarily. As well, we'll open those phone lines up and we'll continue that discussion. Uh, and so I uh, hope you'll stay with us. But here's our contact information once again, 250 The Boulevard. If you're in the Eden area, if you want to reach me, 276-340-2653 or 336-394-5721 or is phone numbers in which you can reach us here, uh, word Lord at gmail.com. And uh, we also have some new phone lines I'm seeing uh, for the station, which we'll get to those Whenever we put them up, but there are some new numbers, so we want you to know how to get in touch with us anytime you can. Uh, if you're in the Martinsville uh, area or the Danville area, 120 American Legion in Danville, uh, Mark's number is 434-770-8412. And if you're in uh, Martinsville, 823 Starling Avenue, you can reach Brother Eugene Edwards at 276-806-6922. And we hope that you will. Uh, visit with the brethren there if you're uh, in in town in Danville on Tuesday night That's when the brethren meet at 7 o'clock on, on American Legion or uh, 7 o'clock on Wednesday night in, in Martinsville come on down to Eden uh, 7 o'clock on Thursday night so you can study, study the Bible uh, three days during the week uh, with us and then of course you can watch uh, a word from the Lord uh, what does the Bible say a word from the Lord and religious view on Thursday nights at, at 9 o'clock religious review coming up at 10 30 after the news tonight, and hope that you will uh, 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 st stay tuned for that. You know, uh, friends, I want to uh, just kind of make mention of this. Uh, I, I think they would want me to make a, a lot of mention about it. I'm, I'm not real sure, but, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the KKK is rallying again, and I think they're supposed to have a, uh, uh, a rally at some point. They'd want me to tell you when, and uh, probably they'd. Well, I don't know. They might not want to know. Want you to know where, but, but nonetheless, they'd want you to want us to make mention of it. But, I, you know, something that they said. This is the KKK rally that took place up in Stewart uh, last or uh, this past May, I guess it was. Was it May? No, it wasn't May. It was uh, uh, April, maybe. I, I'm, I'm sure. But in, in nonetheless, nonetheless, it was. Uh, uh, up in Stewart, Virginia, and uh, they had this rally. And this guy, he said something that that, in, that just kind of stuck with me, stuck on my mind, because I think a lot of people need to realize just the power of three words. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Just three words is what we're going to be talking about tonight. We're going to be dealing with some phrases that are just three words. But just to show you the power of, that you can get, that you can have, and the, um, I guess the the mental picture of three words. Just listen to what this fellow says uh, in three words. Listen closely. We might. It's kind of a weak audio, uh, Scotty. So be sure we got some audio turned up here. I have three more words. What?
White power. Just three words. White power. Just three words. White power. Well, you know, I have three words for, <coughs> for, for th these uh, folks, too. Here's three more words. Uh, stay in school. You know, you want three more words? How about uh, learn to count? White power is not three words. I'm sorry. All right? Are three more wise words to be quit the clan. Now, I don't make a lie. The, the fellow misspoke, whatever, but still it makes, a, it makes a powerful impression. The fact that three words. So how about three more words? How about three words that are really more important and when you put them together, form a phrase that really is something you need to pay attention. Three more words. You know, if you're talking about something that's important, you can say a lot of things uh, it, with a lot of words. The, the, uh, the old adage is a picture's worth a thousand words. But there's another saying that says brevity is the soul of wit. In other words, the shorter and to the point it is, the more likely you're going to remember it. There's a reason why the Proverbs in the Bible or any proverb is short and pithy and, and, and sort of to the point. It's so that people can remember it. You can keep it in your mind and you can walk away and you can think about it. And so brief statements are really powerful, you know. So number one, let's learn to count. But number two, let's talk about three words or three word phrases that really you need to pay attention to. Now, here's one that we're going to talk about tonight, and it's interesting that, that I had this prepared to, to talk about, and when I came in, the, a caller that was on the phone was actually talking to Mark about this three-word phrase. Here's three important words. How about this? Church of Christ. Now, why is that important, friends? Let's count them. Church of Christ. Yeah, that's three. I got them in there. So, Church of Christ. Listen. Friends, when we're talking about the church of Christ, those three words are something that you need to listen and you consider what we're saying, what we mean, or what the Bible says when he uses a phrase like this. The church of Christ is not a brand name. It's not a, it's not a name that says, well, we're all a church of Christ and everybody's a part of the church of Christ, like the caller said. You know, the caller said, well, he's in the Baptist church and we're all churches of Christ. Oh, no, you're not. Friends, you're not in the church of Christ unless you can read about it being a part of the church of Christ in the Bible. Now, here's why we're saying the church of Christ. Now, the one caller said, well, why not church of God? The church of God is used more time than the church of Christ. Well, let's talk about this. Mark, Mark pulled this up and he, he may mention this. But in Acts 26, uh, excuse me, Acts uh, 20 and verse 28, here's what, well, if I can get it here, Acts 20 and verse 28. Now this is what Paul is writing to the elders at Ephesus, and here's what he says. He says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, what church is Paul talking about when he says the church of God? Well, friends, there is only one kind of church in the Bible. Now, it may be called the church of God here, but it belongs to Christ. Who is God that purchased the church with his own blood? Now, if you look at Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, we know who's going to build the church. And therefore, who's going to purchase the church? Jesus said, I say unto thee, I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now, whose church is it? Is Jesus God? Is Jesus deity? Is Jesus one of the, uh, uh, the Godhead? Now, I know some of you folks out there don't know three words. Y'all don't know Father, Son, and Spirit. I know y'all don't know those three words. But Jesus is one of those three. He is the son. He is the one who died on the cross and purchased the church with his blood. All right? Now notice this. In Ephesians, let's go to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 20, uh, uh, verse 23. The husband is the head of the wife, even the cross is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. 
Now, let's skip on down here to verse 26 or verse 25. The husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, how did he give himself for it? He died on the cross for it. He shed his blood for it. He purchased it with his blood. Now, that is why the church of God belongs to Christ who is God. He is deity. Now, when we're saying he is God, we're not saying that he is a God like the Jehovah's Witness, but we're simply stating that he has a divine nature. That is what we're pointing to. We're pointing to the fact that he is part of the divinity or he is part of a divine nature. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, for in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Or in him dwelleth the fullness of the divine nature bodily. He is divinity. He is deity. He possesses this divine nature as does the Father and does the Spirit. So Jesus, God, bought a church. Therefore, it is the church of God or the church of Christ. It is belonging to him. That's what we're saying. That's the indication. So when we're talking about the church of God, we're talking about a church that belongs to Christ or a church that was uh, uh, purchased with his blood. He, Christ, is, the, is, is God who shed his blood for it or purchased it with his blood. And that's why it belongs to Christ. It is his. He bought it. He built it. He purchased it with his own blood. Now, the church of God and the church of Christ are one and the same. The same kind. Now, let me, let me just go into this a little bit. Maybe we need to understand what church means. Church, in a very basic and simple form, simply means a called out group of people. All right? A group that has been called together, called out of one place and into another place. Now, here is how the word is used in a, a, a secular or a worldly sense. In Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 19, verse 32, notice this. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. Now the word assembly is the word church. Same word, same word, church. But in this case, it is a group of people who are out in public and they're gathered around there like a mob. And it is called an assembly, but it's the same word, ecclesia, that, that is translated everywhere else, church. Only three times it's translated assembly, and it's right here in, in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, verse 32, it is the assembly. Now notice this. They knew not wherefore they were come together. The assembly, the coming together. They didn't know why they were come together, why they had been drawn together, but they were just assembled in a group, and it is called the ecclesia. Now, if we skip on down in this, in this context, notice this. In verse, uh, let's see, verse 35. No, let's go to 36. Uh, now, the, the, the town clerk, here's what he said. He's trying to appease all these Ephesians, these, these, this great mob. And here's what he says. He says, uh, Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet for ye ha and to do nothing rashly. For ye have brought hither these men, which neither robbers of churches nor let blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius, verse 38... If Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open and there is deputies, let them implead one another. But if ye inquire anything concerning this matter, other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly, a lawful ecclesia, a lawful church, just the word assembly, a lawful gathering together of individuals for this purpose. He says, look, you are come together and you're just a mob. You don't know why you're here. You just come together in a mob. But what you need to do, if you want a, a, a law, you want to take a matter to before the courts, what you need to do is have it determined in a lawful assembly, a purposed calling together. A calling together where you know what's going on and the reason why it's there. Listen, the assembly 
the assembly ought to be a called group of people who come together for a certain purpose and called for a certain reason. That's why he says, the town clerk says, he, look, he goes on to say, he says, for we are in danger to be called into question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account for this, of this concourse. There's no reason why we should be saying, or why we're here. You have no reason why you're here. No reason to be called together. No one told you to come into this assembly. Now, when you don't understand church, you're not going to understand the phrase church of Christ, those three words. You're not going to understand that. But uh, uh, the church is in a called assembly. Notice this. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. He said, you all are here. You're a big crowd of people, and you've come together. You don't know why you're here. You don't know why you've been called together. Therefore, it is an unlawful assembly. But you want some matters concerning the law? You come in a lawful assembly, an assembly, an ecclesia, a calling together of people who are coming together for a certain specific purpose and who are going to be governed or regulated by a certain set of rules. Now, that was the lawful assembly. Now, we understand that, friends. We understand that up in Pennsylvania County, there, you know, got a big uproar about all the, what is it, the Board of Supervisors. Now, all those people on the Board of Supervisors, they can say, well, you know what, we make up the, we make up the assembly, we make up the council, or we make up the board. <clears throat> but individually, they don't make up the board. They may be a board member, but they are not assembled in a board of supervisors meeting until a certain day of the month in which they're coming together to discuss certain matters. That is when they come together and that is when they are assembled and therefore they are called the assembly. Same way with the church. In the Lord's church, in the Lord's church, people are called together for a specific reason, for a specific person, a purpose, and called by a certain person and told them to assemble. Now in Acts 19, those people were not told to come to an assembly. They weren't told there. They weren't told to come. They weren't told to come and gather, assemble. But in the Bible, the church of Christ, the church of God, is called by the gospel and it is God who does the calling and telling them to come together. Now look at this. In Galatians 1 verse 6, Let's just notice. Let's just notice. Galatians 1, verse 6. Here we go. I marvel. This is Paul talking. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Who did the calling? God does the calling. God called them into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. God's doing the calling. How does he call? Well, he calls through the gospel. Because these Galatians, they heard something that wasn't the gospel and they responded to that call and they wound up somewhere where they shouldn't be. He says, look, you're, you're listening to something that's another gospel. 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 14. Stay with me. Here we go. Paul says, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brothers, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Excuse me. So, called by the gospel. God calls by the gospel. He calls individuals by the gospel. And when he calls individuals by the gospel, he calls them out of the world. He says, come out from among them and be ye separate. You come out of the world and you come into the church. And the church assembles on a specific time, at a specific time or specific day, and they observe certain things. They do certain things like partake of the Lord's Supper. They sing. They pray. They are taught the Word of God. They lay by and store upon the first day of the week. That's when they come together upon the first day of the week, and those are things that they do. Now, if you Say you're in the church, the called out assembly that belongs to Christ, and you don't do those things, friends, you are not in the church of Christ. You're not in the church of Christ. Now, you can say all you want to that you're in the Lord's church, 
even though you're in a Baptist church, but you can't prove that. See, God calls by the gospel. And he didn't tell you to assemble in the Baptist church. He said, he said, assemble as the Lord's church, the church that belongs to Christ. Now, think of it this way, friends, and this might help you. Think of the word church and use people. The church of Christ is the people of Christ. Or they are the people of Christ. The people belonging to Christ. The Baptist church are Baptist people. By definition, they are called people who are Baptist. Or people who are Methodist for the Methodist church. Or Presbyterian people. They are not the church of Christ because nowhere in the New Testament do you ever hear the Lord's church, the one kind of church, ever be identified as some of these other, uh, uh, other names. The church of God and the church of Christ in the Bible are the same kind of church. Now, let me, let me prove this to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, let's just look at this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, through the will of God and Sosothenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. All right? The church of God, which is at Corinth. Now, is this a different kind of church than any other, other churches that Paul's talking to? No, because look at this. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not 1 Corinthians. What am I looking for? First, uh, yeah, First Corinthians 4, 17. So what I'm looking for? Paul says, For this cause I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful to the Lord, who shall bring you to remembrance of all my way, of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. What kind of church was it? What was it, what was it called? It wasn't called the Baptist church. It wasn't called the Methodist Church. It wasn't called the Presbyterian Church. It wasn't called the Pentecostal Holy Church. It wasn't called the United Pentecostal Holy Church. It wasn't called the Apostolic Church. It wasn't called the Catholic Church. And it wasn't called the Church of the Firstborn uh, Free Blood Number 7 either. It was simply the church that belongs to God, the Church of God or the Church of Christ. And you say, well, James, you said Church of God. Now, you need to prove that that's the church of Christ, all right? Well, how about this? How about in Romans chapter 16? Remember, Paul teaches the same thing in all churches. Now, what about this? Now, he's writing to the church at Rome, and he says, Salute one another with the holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Now, was he talking about another kind of church? Was he talking about different kinds, a different kind of church, a group, more than one kind of church of Christ saluting the church of God? Now, now, call are you who are in the church of God, was Paul saying that members of the church of which I'm a member of, was he saying that we are saluting you? Was he saying that, that you're in one kind of church and I'm in another kind of church, but we're saluting one another because we have the same name? He's already said he teaches the same thing in all churches. So if you're in a church of God, or you're in a church that's called the church of God, but you're not teaching or you're not practicing the same thing that Paul practiced, then I know you're not in the church of God that you read about in the Bible. It's not the same kind. It's not the same kind. It, it may have a similar name. It may have the same name, but let me tell you, it's not the same. Now, you know how I know it's not the same? Let me tell you something. You can go to the store. And you can find, in the freezer section, you can find a carton that says, watch this, Mark, that says chocolate ice cream. Now, I can tell you one thing. I, I can guarantee you this. Blue Bunny chocolate ice cream does not taste the same as Blue Bell. I guarantee it. Now, if you have any kind of a desire for some good ice cream, you would eat Blue Bell. Blue Bell chocolate ice cream is a whole lot better than Blue Bunny. Don't say they're the same. Well, they both say chocolate ice cream on them. No, no, they're not the same. They are not the same. 
So just because it may have the same name on it or may identify it by the same name doesn't mean it's the same thing because it is what's inside that makes up what's on the outside, all right? The church of Christ has to look like the right thing on the inside in order for it to be the true church of Christ. Now, here's, here's how I know this. There are some folks around here, I know this, in Danville especially, there are some folks that call themselves the church of Christ. But they're not the church of Christ, folks. What is it, south side and north side? North Danville. North, north Danville, church of Christ. They're not the church of Christ. They're the Christian church. Because what they have on the inside and the way they worship is not identical to what is in the book. See that? Now, if I'm driving by and I say, well, you know, the label looks right. Let's see what's on the inside. Well, it's like that ice cream. You see, say, well, it's chocolate ice cream. Well, you put a spoon in it and say, oh, I, know, I know one thing. That's not the same. I know it's not the same. See? So what we do is we go to the Bible. We find what kind it is. Now, if you don't understand church, you won't understand those three words, church of Christ. So, different kind. Now, watch this. Let's look at this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you want, you want to know how I know the church of Christ and the church of God today are not the same? Look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 34. Now, the church of God has women preachers. The church of God that Paul was writing to said, let your women keep silence in the churches for it's not permitted them to speak. For they are commanded to be under obedience as thus said the law. Now, are they the same or are they not the same? The church of God that you're in, my friend, is not the same as the church of God that you read about in this book. But you know what? The church of God that you read about in this book is exactly like the church of Christ that I'm in. Because that's what we practice, that's what we preach, that's what we teach. That's what we follow. We don't have women preachers. But the church of God that you're in does. See that? See how I know it's different? See how I know it's different? One kind of church. But if you don't understand, if you don't understand that, then you're going to think that it's all, that everybody's the same. Oh no, friends, it's not the same. The New Testament church was never called Baptist, never called Methodist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, whatever. It just never was. So you can call the church anything that the Bible calls it. But don't tell me that you're in the church that Christ died for, that he built, that you are in the church of Christ if you call it something that's not in the Bible. Right there, I know it's wrong. I know it's wrong. And the reason why you call in, friend, and you say, well, I'm in, the, I'm in the Lord's church, but I'm in the Baptist church. The reason why you do that is because you know that church of Christ is something that God does approve of, and the Baptist church is what he doesn't approve of, and you want to be right. But you don't want to be right enough to get out of the church that's not in the Bible. See that? Now, that's three words. You've got to understand. Three words. Church of Christ. The church, the called out people who belong to Christ. Now, the called out people who belong to Christ never called themselves Baptist. Never called themselves Catholic. See that? So, there's three words for you. Church of Christ. Now, here's three more words. Is this, is this somebody from me online too? No, sir. All right. Well, we can go ahead and put the phone lines up because I know I'm not going to get through all this tonight. But... Here's three more words. Here's three more words. Obey the gospel. Obey the gospel. You know why you need to know these three words, friends? It's because most of the time people don't know what to say. They say, well, he got saved. Well, I got saved. Friends, in the Bible, you don't read about people getting saved. What you do is you read about them obeying the gospel. Now, here's why I say that. Here's why I say obey the gospel. Look at this. In Romans 10, verse 13. Let's run, down, run this down real quick. Romans 10 and verse 13. Most of the time, this is where people stop. They say, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There you go. Say a prayer and you're in heaven. Say a prayer and you're sinned and forgiven. That's not what the Bible says. Well, read on. 
If you'll read on, you'll understand these three words. Obey the gospel. All right, it says, call on the name of the Lord and they shall be saved. Well, how do I call on the name of the Lord, Paul? How then shall they call on him and who they've not believed? Well, first of all, you have to believe. First of all, you have to believe. Well, how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? So you've got to hear. You've got to hear something and believe something. And how shall they hear without a preacher? So you have to, be te you have to teach them something that will produce faith in them that will cause them then to call upon the name of the Lord, okay? And how shall they call, how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad times and good things. So calling on the name of the Lord we know involves someone preaching the word, hear, someone hearing the word, and that person who heard it obey, or believed it, all right? Now look what Paul says. He said, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. So obeying the gospel, obeying the gospel involves, we know, preaching the word, someone hearing it, someone believing it, someone calling on the name of the Lord. But now wait a minute. Let's back up a little bit more. Let's go back up before verse 13. All right? Because look at this. There is no difference between Jew and Greek. The same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Now, wait a minute. We're still talking about calling on the name of the Lord? It's like Paul is going backwards here. What else is involved in calling on the name of the Lord? We've heard, we've got, if we go backwards, if we're looking at the verse backwards, remember he's laying it out. You got to do this, but you can't do this until you've done that. Can't do that until you've done this. So what is he saying? You preach, right? You, someone hears what you preach. Someone believes what you preach. But what are you going to do? Well, let's see. Uh, uh, it involves repentance and confession. With the mouth, confession is made to salvation. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. So calling on the Lord... It's actually the same as obeying the gospel. Now, but when I read calling on the Lord, I hear something that Peter says over in Acts chapter 2. Now, let's go there. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 21, Peter and the other eleven said, It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, when he convinces them that they've killed the Christ... He's told them, in order to be saved, you need to call on the name of the Lord. But when he gets down to verse 37, uh, verse 36, when he gets down to verse 36, and they're convinced that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the same Lord that they crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ, here's what he says. They said, when they heard this, they were preaching in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, What do you mean, what shall we do? I've already told you to call the name of the Lord. Don't you get it? They don't know what to do. Calling on the name of the Lord means to do something. And Peter said, Here's what you do to call the name of the Lord. You repent and you be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, when he said, when they said, what must we do? They wanted to have their sins forgiven. He's telling them to call the name of the Lord. And Paul said that's the equivalent of obeying the gospel. Friends, when you hear something, when you hear the gospel, and you believe it, and you obey it, that is when you, that is when you have forgiveness of sins, when you obey the gospel, when you obey the truth. Now notice this, in Romans 2 verse 8, Romans 2 verse 8, you say, well, what am I supposed to obey? Well, look at this, Romans 2 8, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. Now, if you haven't obeyed the word of righteousness, you have obeyed unrighteousness. If you haven't obeyed the truth, you've obeyed, uh, you've disobeyed, you've been contentious, been hard-headed, stubborn, all right? 
So we're talking about the need to obey the truth. Uh, Galatians chapter 3 in verse 1. Paul says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth. So obedience is really the key to calling on the name of the Lord. That's obedience. Obedience is the key. So that's why you obey the gospel. You obey the truth. Those are three words you have to understand, friends, or you're going to walk around going, well, I got saved, I've been saved, I, you know, I went down to the mourner's bench and somebody beat on, me, beat on my back till my lung about birthed and then I knew I got saved. Had a warm, fuzzy feeling. Friends, that's not, that's not how you know you've, been, you, you've had your sins forgiven. That's not how you know that you have been cleansed from your unrighteousness. How you do know is when you have obeyed the gospel. Now look at this. In Galatians 5 and verse 7, Paul again tells the Galatians, remember these are these fickle people that are back and forth and they're, they're going after another gospel. He said, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Someone kept you from continuing to obey the truth. Who, who did it? Who did it? So calling on the Lord is the equivalent of obeying the gospel. Obey the gospel. Obey the truth. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. Here's what Peter said. Seeing then you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another pure and fervently. Obey the truth. Now that's how you know, that's how you know that you have been saved. You obey the gospel. You see, friends, the Bible is always putting emphasis on obedience. It puts emphasis on you obeying what God said do. Not a feeling, not a warm fuzzy, <clears throat> not some mystical feeling and emotional that, well, you know, I had to, had the chills come over me and I woke up and, uh, you know, there's a bright light shining through my window and I just, you know, angels were dancing all around and really what that was, that was uh, uh, something bad you ate and you woke up and the sun was hitting you in the face and you thought you were seeing things. Obeying the gospel, obeying the gospel is what the Bible always stresses. Hebrews 5 verse 9, Christ became the author of salvation to all who will obey him. Now, if that, if that is the key, obeying the truth, if that's the key, then you have to do what Jesus said in order to be saved. If you will be saved, you will obey the truth. You will obey the gospel. You will obey Christ. Now, but why is it when Jesus says this in Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. People always go, oh no, that's not what you got to do. Well, you're not going to be saved if you won't do what Jesus said. Jesus said this, true or false? Did Jesus say he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved? True or false? Did he say it? Yes, he did. True. He said he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Hebrews 5, 9. He is the author of salvation who all will obey him. True or false? True. So, true or false, if someone does not obey Jesus and is not uh, believe and is not baptized, they will not be saved. That's true too. You will not be saved because you have not obeyed the gospel. Now friends, don't give me this, well I got saved and, and, and all this. No, show me the scripture. Show me the scripture. See that? You need to learn those three words. Obey the gospel. Obey the truth. Obey from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered to you, Romans 6, 16 and 17. Obedience to the faith, Romans 1, verse 5. There's three words for you. Three words. Obey the gospel. And if you won't help obeying the gospel, friends, we put our content information up, we'll help you. Here's the new phone numbers are up. Call in. You got a question about what to do to obey the gospel? Give us a call. We'll help you. But don't give me this, well, I have a, I have one feeling my grandma told me or whatever. No. You need to go to the Bible. Now, here's three, here's three more words for you. Remission of sins. 
Remission of sins. Now, the reason why I put these three words up here, friends, because a lot of people don't understand what these words mean. Remission of sins. See, when we ask people, at what point were your sins forgiven? We're saying at what point, we're asking at what point were you pardoned from your sins? Now, everybody should want remission of sins. Everybody should want remission of sins. Because that is what was to be preached. And that is what was to be part of the gospel. When you obey the gospel, this is what you get. Look at this. Luke 24 and verse 47. Uh, Jesus said that from Jerusalem, repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among the all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So remission of sins, it means to be uh, at liberty or to be pardoned from your sins. That's what you ought to be looking for. You on the word of the Lord? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you. Is this James? Yes, it is. Uh, are you live right at the moment? I am live at the moment. You're on the air. Okay. Uh, now, I wanted to go to uh, 2 John, uh, verse 9. Okay. And, and we're talking about what we've been discussing? Yes, about obeying the gospel. Okay. And, and it says, uh, Whosoever transgresseth, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. Okay. So if you don't obey the gospel, if you're not obeying the doctrine of Christ, you hath not God. Right. Now, and then it goes on and says, He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Okay. So th that was the, the point I wanted to make. Okay, yeah. If, you, if, you're not obey, if you're not obeying the doctrine, there's no way you're going to get all the blessings that come with being in Christ or having that relationship uh, with God. Walking in the light is in the light. You don't get any of that unless you're not, uh, if you're not in Christ and abiding in the doctrine of Christ. All right, that's a good point. Yeah, I think uh, right now that I'm seeing a repeat broadcast or something because uh, you're not in sync with what I'm seeing on the TV program. Well, there's a delay. Oh, okay. Are you watching on the uh, internet or are you watching on TV? Very much. Yeah, I'm calling here from Michigan. Uh, okay. Down here, South Muskegon, where uh, okay. we attend the, uh, uh, the congregation in Ludington, Michigan on James Street. Okay. And, all right. And I just wanted to say that we appreciate all that you do there and uh, and and well, I appreciate that. I'm glad we're. I'm glad to know that we're uh, <clears throat> getting some viewership up there. Brother Steve Bateson told me that uh, he'd been getting some phone calls from our broadcast down here. So we're glad we're uh, able to reach out there. Yeah, I was watching uh, Mark uh, McGinnis earlier, and uh, I was having trouble getting through on the phone line. And uh, he w he was talking about uh, how the denominations teach that. Uh, children are born with sin mm -hmm. and I wanted to bring up a scripture for that. Well, I tell you what, let's we're, we're, we're going to try to stay on, on topic on this one uh, and I'm running, yeah. I'm, I'm getting pretty run on short on time, so uh, okay. uh, if you could, okay. let me just well, say that for another I'll let time. You go, then. Thank you very much All right. for your time. Thanks for your call. Alright, uh, Scotty, can you put the Michigan number up on that one? Uh, please, as well. We want to make sure that all the folks who are watching in Michigan uh, in the Muskegon area, that they that, that they know that you have someone local you can call uh, in that area, and we're gonna get that number up there. So, uh, uh, which appreciate the, the brother calling in from Michigan. I'm glad we know that we're up there, that we're looking, that uh, people are watching us and uh, and and getting benefit from the broadcast. But we want you to know too that especially in in Muskegon, we've been going up there since August the first. We've been broadcasting up there, <clears throat> simulcasting. Uh, what does the Bible say at 8 o'clock and the Word of the Lord at 9 o'clock are going uh, live up there. So uh, we'll be, we're glad uh, to know that you're watching. But anyway, remission of sins. Here's what we're dealing with. Remission of sins. You, you want to have this, but you need to understand what it means. All right? Now, notice we know that remission of sins only comes through the blood of Christ. 
All right, Romans 3.25. Everybody, everybody understands that. And everybody says, well, you, you, you don't have your sins forgiven unless it's with the blood. You've got to contact the blood. I understand that. We know that. The Bible says, <clears throat> the Bible says, Who, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through the faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now, but here's the key. Do you obtain remission of sins because you believe in the blood? Because you believe the blood was shed? Or is there another way or is there something else that you must do in order to contact the blood in order to obtain remission of sins? Do you just have faith that he shed his blood? Is that all you really need? Well, watch this. You need more than just faith that he shed his blood because you have, to, you have to do something in order to contact that blood. Now, watch this. Remission of sins comes through the blood. That's true. No doubt about it. Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And Luke 24.47, a verse we just read, Repentance and remission of sins are preached together. All right? So you have to repent in order to have remission of sins. Now, but when we get to Acts 2.38, a verse that a lot of people don't like, notice what Peter says. Now, Peter connects remission of sins and re or, or connects repentance and remission of sins with being baptized. All right? Uh, 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 let's see my get my Bible back up here Acts 2 verse 38 here it says Peter says repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins Peter actually puts baptism in between repentance and remission of sins so when Jesus said that repentance and remission of sins were going to be preached beginning at Jerusalem he was just giving a couple of the, the main points. But remission of sins is not going to come until after you are baptized for the remission of sins. Now, if you're trying to find remission of sins, you want to obtain remission of sins before, uh, before baptism, you're, you're, uh, uh, you, you don't find that in the Bible, Okay. It popped up there, Mark, and I can't get back to my thing now. Uh, all right. So, so you, you, need to, you need to realize that if you're going to have remission of sins, it has to come after baptism. Because, yes, you're saved from your sins. Your sins are remitted. But it's after you're baptized for the remission of sins. Now, if you want to make the argument, well, that means because your sins are forgiven... Friends, you really don't want to go there. Jesus shed his blood in order that sins could be forgiven, not because they were already forgiven. Matthew 26, 28. So remission of sins is after you're baptized. It's the same thing as saved. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that repenteth and is baptized will have remission of sins. See that? It's, a, it's the same uh, uh, a parallel, if you will. Now, three words, remission of sins. All right? Three words. Church of Christ. Three words. Obey the gospel. Now, I know I'm running out of time, but I want to get this, 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 another three words in here. Here's three more words. How about just prove it? How about just prove it? Just prove it. When people come up and say, well, you know, miracles still today, I say to prove it. Now, I want to try to play you some of this. Uh, it's, uh, it's not too awful long, but it's, more, it's longer than what we have time for. This is a preacher that came up to the tent, the last day of the tent meeting. His name is Daniel somebody. He's from South Boston. If you know anybody in South Boston from the Church of God, ironically enough, Mark, he's from the Church of God. He stopped by the tent. He said, yeah, we just finished up a revival and we had all kinds of healing. Well, when he started talking about healing, I got my camera out. I got my phone out and started recording. And here's a little bit of what he said. Uh, I might should try to play this. Uh. You've been 
around here. Stop walking. Stop walking. Well, well, Brother John stop Shannon is there with me. About an hour and a half from here, maybe. Which way? On past Danville. Now he's already said he's done some miracles. Uh, maybe when he's on 29. So here, here's where we're going to get to. Well, I would like to see a miracle. Huh? I would like to see a miracle. Would you? Yeah. Me too. We've got a fella here that's uh, legally blind. And uh, I know he'd like to have a sight restored. Would well, you lay hands and pray for him? No. We want you to do it. We want you to do it. <laughs> All right, so he said, well, did you lay hands on and pray for him? We want him to do it. He's the one been talking about just turned a man who's pigeon-toed and straightened his legs out and healed a cancer on his lady's side and, and this said, no, we want him to do it. We want him to do it. You going to be in town? No, I'm going back. I'm going back home. Now think about this. Listen, you want to come up and tell me you've got the power to heal and then there's somebody that, that, that's blind and someone's crippled. Brother John Shannon's standing right there. He's got fingers cut off, maimed. And say, well, why don't you just demonstrate it right there? How easy that would be. But oh no, oh no, no, it, it's going to take a little time. I want you to lay in on this. Brother, if you had faith, you can do it. Well, now the Bible says the only reason why people weren't healed in the first century was because the healer didn't have faith. What does it say that at? In Matthew 7. Matthew 17. Now, now where to say that at? Now he's got now he's got the power to heal. He got the power to heal. I guess he didn't have that other gift of spirit that to, you know the, the word of knowledge. I guess he just got to get the healing. Thing is, John, you say that you have to sit faith with a grain of mustard seed. So, and I'm saying if it doesn't happen, it may be our fault. But I'm saying if you've got the faith. Then, you, you know, you can't blame, you know, I mean, don't come to it with an attitude like, well, if it don't happen, it means I ain't got faith. It, not everyone I pray for gets healed. Well, not in but the Bible. some do. <coughs> well, but some do, but not all do. But in you the know. Bible, in the Bible, when they brought the sick, they were all healed. And it was all immediate. Acts 3. When Peter healed the lame man. All right, now, now he he getting antsy because he walked in, <laughs> Mark. He walked in. He thought that uh, he was going he was going to uh, have a friendly little uh, chat and and he's going to uh, talk about all his uh, shenanigans under his tent and he was going to find a, a, a an audience, a willing a participating audience. I'm going to see if I can skip on down through some of this and. Uh, and uh, get him out there toward the end. I told you what God did, and you don't believe. I don't because you didn't demonstrate it. That's the whole purpose of the miracles, was for you to prove that you what you're saying is the word of God. Now, if you if you really have the power, or God's working through you, to demonstrate something. Sound like they say to Jesus, if you be the Son of God, come off of that cross. But Jesus had already lived three years, demonstrating Jesus. that he was the Son of God. Had he not? Nicodemus said, no man can do these miracles. No man can do these miracles except God be with him. Now, what did you demonstrate? What did I demonstrate? Yeah. With? Right here. You're saying, I don't believe you. Demonstrate something. I can't. Jesus couldn't perform any miracles in his hometown town. So my unbelief is holding him back. All these people's unbelief was holding Jesus back. Let me tell you something, friends. Just prove it. If you want us to believe that you can do whatever you can do, just do it. Prove it. Listen, if I told you, if I told you I could, I could go outside and I could fly home, just leave my car here, just fly home, would you believe me? Now, now no one's going to believe that. But yet these guys come in and they want us to believe that they are the willing vessels for all this miraculous power just because they said it. Prove it. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 4, Paul said that, you know, when he came to speaking, 
It was not with uh, enticing words of man's wisdom, but it was in demonstration. He actually demonstrated what he was talking about. He said, but in demonstration of the spirit and the power, just prove it. Just prove it. But yet these guys want us to believe at face value what they're saying. I say they're liars. I say they're liars. He worked for Hardee's. I, I would show, I'll see if I can show you. Um, and show you that. He, he worked for Hardy's. He got back in his little Hardy's truck. And, uh, you know, I said, I, I, I know I know Hardy's doesn't sell Whoppers, but the guy that works for him, he sure tells them. So, uh, <clears throat> anyway, let's see here. He wouldn't. Unbelief. He wouldn't. He'd already done three miracles. Except heal a few sick. He, well, that's a miracle. You haven't healed the first one. Well, I have. You have not. Prove it. Your word, I'm not going just because you say something doesn't mean that you did it. Brother, it's always there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people say they do stuff all the time. Man, but that doesn't prove they did it. You don't have to believe. The, I know I don't have to believe you because you. I don't have to believe him. I don't have to believe him. Well, friends, that's stuff that comes out of the tent. But I, I tell you one thing. Uh, I bet he won't just drive by another tent and just drop in on him again. I think we broke him from sucking eggs. But if you know somebody, if you know Daniel, the preacher for the... Church of God in South Boston, I gave him an invitation to come on back. He can come on TV and demonstrate his little miracles. And, uh, you know, we can, we, can, we can do it again. We can set somebody up here and see if they can demonstrate it. Can't do it. But, friends, three words that all you need to remember is somebody says they can do miracles, just prove it. Just do it. Three words. Three words, friends. Three little words that you need to remember. And so we hope that this has helped you, been educational, beneficial to you. We're going to close out. I do want you to stay tuned for our religious review tonight, uh, coming up at 1030 after the news. Uh, let me get my, see if I can get my content information up here before we um, get off the air here. May not be able to do it. All right. Just remember, thanks for watching, friends. Always remember to ask, what does the Bible say? You'll get... You'll uh, get a word from the Lord, and you'll be able to do your own religious review. Have a good night. Church, only to find a club. Are you tired of looking for the Bible, but only getting babble? If you want to find people who are studying God's Word, come examine the Church of Christ. We're meeting right here at 250 The Boulevard in downtown Eden. If you want to hear more plain Bible teaching, Watch A Word from the Lord, Thursday nights at 9 o'clock, right here on WGSR.